As a true Bible student knows, there's some amazing and much needful lessons that come from the Old Testament that help us serve the Lord as we live under the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. And I would like for us to turn to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and look at some things found therein. So if you would like to turn there, we'll be noticing several things as we go through this study. I think the book of Malachi, of course it could be said of other matters too in the Bible, is a most arresting and interesting book. The name Malachi simply means angel of the Lord. We're not really sure who the actual author was. But it was written during the period of Israel's decline. And it offers some very strong reproofs against the shabby practices of the priests and the Levitical priesthood themselves. One thing the entire book cries out against is hypocrisy. As you know, uh, our word hypocrisy comes from a word in the Greek language, hypocrites, which means to play a part. And you know, many actors don't want to be typecast because they play a part so long they get it in the type of part and they don't want to be forever identified with that part. Well, a Christian is to be genuine and pure and what he believes and what he or she does is to be honest. So hypocrites have always been in a bad light as far as the Bible is concerned. But the writer of uh, Malachi is pleading with sinful Israel to basically stop play acting when it comes to their worship as well as their service to God. Can you see how these things said to fleshly Israel in a period of decline would have application to spiritual Israel? Any time, sometimes more than others. For our own spiritual building up or edification, we want to consider the passages that use the word wherein. Wherein. And in considering those passages, we want to make a present day application. And I would remind you again, as we do most often, of Paul's writing in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And there, of course, he means the value of the Old Testament to us who are under Christ in the New Testament. So let's study these passages and just see how well they can apply today to help us be better servants of God as Christians in the Lord's church. In the first chapter of Malachi, in the second verse, we find a statement from God, and then we find a question that portrays what I think can only be considered as very shallow thinking as far as Israel was concerned. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Now look at the response of Israel. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Well, what direction would Israel be able to look, fleshly Israel, and fail to see the love of God and the providence of God in the formation of their race and down through the ages? For us today in spiritual Israel, we would do well in considering what is said in James 1 and verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If we love the Lord, 
then we will keep his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. If we keep his commandments, then the Lord will pour out blessings upon us that we could never fully count. Now, Israel had been delivered from Egyptian bondage for one reason, because God loved them. They'd been fed, and they had been protected throughout their wilderness wanderings. Eventually, he brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of Canaan. And they were blessed in so many ways, even in taking the land. They were told, you'll be in other people's houses. You won't even have to build houses. You'll have vineyards and farmland waiting on you. So Israel was the espoused people of God. And they had prospered abundantly when they had been obedient. But now, according to what Malachi says here, they shall we say, presumptuously ask, wherein hast thou loved us? I think I've seen a few people over the years, maybe a lot more than that, that I know about directly, who in the church, they would be so burdened down with the affairs of this world that they'd say, you know, why has God done this to me? Or why after all this time has this taken place, et cetera, et cetera think those things proved to them they didn't have the faith maybe they once thought they did so the same attitude it manifests itself today in multitudes of people the person outside of Christ and lost in his alien sins Romans 3 verse 23 and Romans 6 23 acts as if, acts as if God's love had never been revealed to mankind. But when you look around you at nature, alone, you see just how God has revealed his love and his concern in the material things around about us. I suggest sometime that when you're reading about the second coming of Christ, and how those who are unprepared to have him come, that it says that they will be destroyed from the glory of his power. People don't realize today that in this material world, this place to get ready to meet our maker, to seek after God, to learn the way of righteousness, to prove to God we love him and that we want to be like him. We fail to realize how much of the grace of God and material things is poured out upon us. When you see people cast into hell after the day of judgment because they were unprepared to meet their maker, all favor and love of God is removed. They didn't want him here and they get their reward there. You don't want me here, then you'll have a place where there's no evidence at all of my existence. You deny that I exist, so I'll put you in a place like that, if that's what you wanted. And thus you find hell described the way that it is. But yet look around you today. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. And just look at all of the blessings that people get, but they don't, they don't know where it comes from, or they won't admit that it comes from God because they don't believe in God. Are they attributed to luck alone or some false gods or religion? But then when we come to the spiritual ways, forgiveness of sins, the way to heaven, God's religion, pure and undefiled religion, James 1.27, we see that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3 verse 16. Now, in contemplation of that marvelous, wonderful, and great gift, can any one of us ask, 
today? Of God, wherein hast thou loved us? And surely none will affirm that we deserve or we merit such love from God. Do you just ever ask yourself the question, especially in America when we're the most privileged people on earth in so many ways? Why wasn't I born in Africa or India or Indonesia or China? Could have been. Of course, with these great blessings we have here, great responsibilities placed upon us to use them as children of God to spread and defend the gospel. But seeing that most of the world's population is somewhere besides the United States, they'll not realize it was God's grace, that alone, that allowed me to be born into the United States. So without even considering the forgiveness of sins, that comes through Christ and our obedience to his gospel, his power to save us, Romans 1, 16. Look what we have even in just being born into this land where Bibles are everywhere. Years ago, I saw a man receive a Bible in China, and I can still see him right now. He was looking at it, turning it over, and you've heard me, some of you have mentioned this before. He opened it up, he turned it around, he opened up the front cover and the back cover. He flipped through it, just giving a general going over. And the fellow who was there was another Chinese brother. He said, this is the first time he's ever seen the Bible. Can you remember the first time you ever saw a Bible? You cannot. They're everywhere. Of course, I can ask the question, what good are they doing people when they're just covered with dust and people don't study them or attempt to learn how? And apply the truth to their lives. But God's grace places us into a, a country like that. And God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. So Jesus the son of God. Manifests the love of God. And the great sacrifice of Christ on the cross. As is said in John 1 and verse 5 or 15, in John chapter 15 and verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That would be a lesson to study for a while and just what all does that imply about our conduct in Christ and following in his steps. So in view of what Jesus did, can we still and would we dare ask, wherein hast thou loved us? The flesh of Israel got to that stage. And I assure you if they did, we can, and I'm afraid some have. But again in the first chapter, we find another question. And you say, wherein have we despised thy name? Wherein have we despised thy name? Then he points out that a son gives honor to his father. Yet fleshly Israel had not honored him. Points out that a, a servant honors his master. But they had not honored God as their Lord. They were holy W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly dependent up on him. But they would not confess that dependency. When is the last time you sat down and as you contemplated <laughs> spiritual matters in your own life in the light of the truth and said, where would I be without God? What would I have without God? How dependent am I on God? And we might consider things a lot different. Those people offered him no oblation of praise. Yet he had consistently and constantly done good unto them as they obeyed him. And what's amazing is you know he warned them plainly that if you disobey me, you will be punished. So they knew what would happen when they disobeyed him. So 
with all of that, they still despised his name by not honoring and respecting his word. It's not enough for any of us to say, well, the Bible's wonderful word of God. It's for our direction. We should honor it and appreciate it, love it, hunger and thirst after righteousness found therein. But then when we don't do what it said, the way he said it, and for the reason he said it, what good are all those words from our mouths? There are multitudes of people, and they grow daily, who despise the name of the Lord today. I think you'd be surprised if you tried to carry on a conversation with people about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or just the existence of God, how many people would scoff at it, make light of it, wouldn't discuss it at all. In Matthew 1 and verse 21, we read, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Thus it was said, as to the name of Jesus, or as to the name that the Son of God would be given. So it's a divine name. That name is despised by all who refuse the salvation on our Lord's terms. Now he outlined, or he offered salvation in plain terms. And as you read, if nothing else, through the book of Acts, you see people obeying the gospel. Peter plainly said early in those early days of the church, neither is there salvation any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. It was Jesus himself who ordained that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, beginning from Jerusalem, Luke 24, 47. And Paul wrote the words that you see above my head now, Colossians 3, 17, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. I know that a great many people think that means just call out the name of Jesus over whatever it is that you do, and that sanctifies it. That's not what that means at all. It means you do it by the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. And thus Peter commanded people who evidenced their belief in him by interrupting the sermon that he and the other apostles were preaching on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ there in Jerusalem, crying out because they were pricked in their heart by the truth they understood that Christ was the Son of God, They'd put him to death. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter took them as believers in Christ and commanded them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Verse 38. At the household of Cornelius, he also commanded in Acts 10, 48, that those Gentiles be baptized. So... We come back again to Colossians 3.17. For the child of God, our submission to the Lord to be as it ought to be, everything we do, we seek authority from the Lord to do it. We seek to do it in His name. When we offer praise to God, but through a human name, human authority, human doctrine, we're doing nothing less than despise the name of the Lord. People can read in the Old Testament where fleshly Israel ran off after idols over and over again. And they say, just how could they do it? Well, look around about you today. People say God exists. Jesus Christ, Son of God, the only Savior of the world. The Bible is the Word of God. And yet they will say, it doesn't really make any difference what you believe. If so, you're sincere. God will accept it. We're not so unlike those apostate Israelites of long ago. So failure to obey the authoritative commands of the Lord is just another way of despising his name, regardless of what we may say with our mouths. And our Lord addressed that. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? 
Well, in the very next verse of Malachi, they ask of God in chapters, but still chapter 1, verse 7, Wherein have we polluted thee? Wherein have we polluted thee? Well, God recounted the grievances against them. He says, you've offered polluted bread upon God's table. You've offered for sacrifice the blind, the halt, the lame animals. And God gets down on our level and says, you wouldn't even offer that to the governor. He would receive it if you did. They would not only give their best to the governor, but then they palmed off the pitiful and the wretched to God. I don't know how they reason in their heart because they are a people who for a long time have already departed from the will of God for their day. Maybe they thought this is the way people do things. Well, God won't eat these burnt offerings anyway. He won't use our offerings for breeding stock or whatever. I don't know how people justify themselves in rationalizing to break God's will. But, of course, remember, God knows the depth of our being, and he knows our motives, he knows our thoughts. There's no escaping that. And he saw what was within the heart, even as he does for us. And he was greatly displeased, to say the least. He knew they offered stale, moldy bread that they would not eat, as the law of Moses required them to offer. He saw the lame and the crippled and sacrifices that they didn't want. It's a good way to get rid of them. They, they were seeking a get-by, feel-good religion. But what do we learn from God about that? He wouldn't have it. And he makes it clear. And that was written before time for our learning. And what does it say about our respect for the authority of God in the New Testament? So many people today are trying to give God the bad end of their lives. They want to serve Satan as long as they can and then just sort of squeak in at the last minute. That's not to say that a person who's an older person and hasn't lived for the Lord because they rejected the gospel can obey the truth honestly and wholeheartedly and from the heart when they're an old person. Not to say that at all. It just means that when you set your heart to do as you please on this earth, knowing full well everybody's going to die, but yet you turn a deaf ear to the Word of God and say, well, now I'm getting close to the end of my life. I think I'll, I'll be baptized. And God never intended such a thing as that. They want a religion that will... Well, we'll call it a fire escape religion. That's basically what they're looking for. They just want to get by. There are many of those like people who claim discipleship. But again, they're offering the polluted and the moldy. When we offer that which we can easily do without, have we truly sacrificed to the Lord? Oh, how we need to cultivate the spirit of David of old. When he said in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 24, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord of that which cost me nothing. We need to think about that in the application of Matthew 6.33 to our day-to-day -day living as Christians. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So our service and our, even our worship can be polluted even as theirs was under the law of Moses when we give less than our best. But again, the people ask, Malachi 2 and verse 17, Wherein have we wearied him? Wherein have we 
fleshly Israel wearied God. Well, they had wearied him, first of all, through their vain, which means empty or pointless words, and their lying vows. If you look through the book, you'll see they had treated marriage lightly. They had dealt treacherously with their wives. And when you look around about you today at the attitude men have toward what the Bible teaches about marriage, divorce, remarriage, about male and female, I don't know that we're far removed from those people. Especially if you're in churches that try to figure out ways to justify all those folks. They had ignored the words of God. Listen to what was said. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Every time a marriage that is a Matthew chapter 19, 6, God joined undefiled bed marriage is broken up sins involved always is that the case these people of that time fleshly Israel condoned evil and they tried to justify those who were wicked have we changed a lot today God wouldn't allow them to pass Judgment in his stead on their own compromised and corrupted standard. The commonness of sin led them to sanction the way of error. It always does. Hasn't changed today. So God was wearied at their what we might call soft soap teaching and living and compromise of his will. Today, God is wearied by those who say, why, they're good people, even though they're not religious, or they're good people, even though they're not New Testament Christians. We tend to judge by prevalent morals and today's social standards that are developed by the present culture. We must remember that God uses another standard for such measurement. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In America, we certainly have become accustomed to putting away so that divorce and remarriage for any reason whatsoever has become an accepted way of life. But Jesus is still saying, as he did in Matthew 19, from the beginning, it hath not been so. We make excuses for religious error and the false prophets who espouse them. But you don't hear that coming from the word of the living God. In 2 John 9 through 11, whosoever transgresseth, the American Standard 1901 says, goeth onward. And abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and receive him not into your house, neither bidding God speed, For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Don't weary the Lord by trying to exonerate teachers that you know teach contrary to the truth, whatever the topic is. It won't work. And Malachi taught us that. Then the Lord offered Israel a glorious opportunity to make things right. He gave them this promise, return unto me, and I will return unto you. Look how simple that is. I'll be with you. I'll guide you. You'll have what I promised to you if you will but turn around and come back to me, which means 
live once again as I teach, Malachi 3, 7. Now, as you go through the book, you'll see that Malachi described the shabbiness with which the priest had polluted his table, how they'd dealt with his worship and defaming it, you might say. They condoned evil and all sorts of wickedness. And in all of that and other matters, they dishonored God's name. And yet they're asking, wherein shall we return? How have we left anything? Well, they were called on law for a spiritual service. And from the heart, they were to obey God. But they were going through the motions, various rituals and formalities of worship. And they thought that was enough. But here's where God says, give up the sham. Give up the cheap hypocrisy. And truly from the heart and totally serve God. Well, today the alien sinner must return to the Lord. The apostate must repent and come back to the Lord. If you're overtaking any one trespass, you must repent, turn away from it, and come back to the Lord. Isn't that a simple message? How hard is it to understand what I just said? Man departed from God by sinning. Sin is the only thing that separates you from God. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. You die guilty of your sins. There's but one place you're going to be for eternity, and that's in a devil's hell. Man doesn't like to hear that. Many in the church don't want to hear that. But remember, fleshly Israel is the type of the church. And those things are written for not only them, but for us to have the right attitude toward living for the Lord. The one who has become a child of the living God and has turned away from him must by repenting of sin and by prayer to God having confessed his sins find forgiveness. As I've said many times and will continue to say that is God's second law of pardon and it's for the child of God who sins. When God accursed, accused I should say, when God accused Israel of having robbed him, notice this, wherein have we robbed thee? Malachi 3, 8. Well, the reply is in tithes and offerings. Israel had withheld their tithes and offerings that the law of Moses required of them, and it was due God. Our giving today is different from theirs as to what we give. We have free will offerings. We give as we've been prospered. That's the way we're instructed to give. And we're instructed to give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. We're taught to grow in this grace also. But those people at that time wouldn't abide by the will of God for them. In effect, they uh, shortchanged God, as if he wouldn't know what they did. And this is not the only sordid example of such terrible conduct. You remember back early on, very early on, as they were beginning to take the land of Canaan under Joshua, that Achan thought he could keep that which belonged to God. And it cost him his life and those of his family because they all became a party to it. And it's interesting, that was as they entered the land of Canaan. And then when you come to right after the church is established, the first sin in the church was sort of the same thing. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit in a vain attempt to keep that which they pretended to give to the Lord. It's interesting, the beginning of fleshly Israel, you have that kind of sin and how God deals with it. At the beginning of spiritual Israel, you have the same thing. You'll remember that Judas Iscariot sold the Lord for the 30 pieces of silver. Are these there to teach us something about our possessions and our service to God? Paul warned Timothy, a preacher who should know it himself, and preach it to the brethren, for the love of money is the root of all evil. The Greek just simply says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. Well, 
many today seek to rob God in more ways than just material things. Rob God of their influence for good. Rob God regarding time, regarding their energy. Then there are many in the kingdom who are robbing God as did Israel. How did that happen? By not giving to God as he has prospered them. I don't know how it works with people's minds altogether. But I've seen it happen over and over again. A person is taught to give up on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. People go out of town or they're sick or they're whatever. And they don't give for a week, two weeks. And when they come back, they don't try to make it up. What goes on in their mind is God reviews it and they know what's said in the Bible that says that's all right. That's all right. God also promised Israel that if the people would repent that they would be blessed. This is what's said in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God's always been that way. Over the years, I know for a fact personally that sometimes you haven't known <laughs> where some things are going to come from. But you trusted God to supply what he said he would if you'd serve him faithfully. And never in all the years that I can think of has there ever been anything going back on that by God. Thus the Lord promises that if we'll only treat him right, what does he say he'll do? And does he keep his promises? Well, the windows of heaven will open. And such blessings will be poured out. Somebody said there won't be stacking room for all of them. Surely no sane man will contend that it's good to try to rob God. We receive all good things from him. Surely we must give him our best in return. We must give of him our time and talents and our means to be sure but the way that's really done and here the lesson is yours is that you give all you are and have to him and all that there is to give goes with it so don't try to rob God by withholding your life from him that's what had happened really to these people that's the reason it's such a lesson for us People withhold their lives from God. They won't obey Him. They won't believe in Him. They do as they please and they wonder where is God in time of trouble. If you're not a child of God, we've studied this morning already in the sermon just exactly what the Bible says one must do to become a Christian. Even for Christians who sin, what to do to get forgiveness of sins. And now we offer an invitation. It's the Lord's invitation. It's the bride of Christ's invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest to your soul. The sad part about it is that many people don't know the burden of sin because they don't have the respect of the Bible for how terrible and heinous sin is. Thus, they don't see it. But if you're subject, if you're honest before God, He searches your heart, and you honestly examine yourself as to your relationship to Him. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it while we stand and sing.